guys, this is Nadia Andreva from spinachandyoga.com and this is a Happy Belly interview series where I'm interviewing various experts about digestive health and what they're doing to keep their belly happy. And today we have one of my favorite friends and actually a person who wrote a big part of the book, one of the chapters of the book about food sensitivities, Donna James. Donna is the founder of um, a thriving practice in New York City called Food Coach NYC, and she's a triple certified nutritionist and functional medicine practitioner who helps women to overcome weight issues, digestive issues, hormonal issues. So basically, um, she has so much wisdom to share, and besides sharing some general tips, we're also going to dive into what makes Donna's belly happy, which I personally can't wait to find out. (laughs) Thank you, Nadia. What a lovely introduction. You can introduce me anytime I'm going to be speaking. That was beautiful. (laughs) So um, let's go straight straight to the subject matter. So you wrote a part of the book. um, So you do believe that digestion is important. Um, Digestion is fundamental to our health. Fundamental. That is the, to me, the basis of our health. If we cannot digest our nutrients, then we're not going to be getting the precursors to enable the rest of our body to function appropriately. That's just at its most basic level. But it's it's just so, so key to optimal health. I, I'm so with you. Um, what does a happy belly mean for you? How do you feel? Like, today I have a happy belly. <laughs> <laughs> I have a happy belly when I have a flat belly when it's not bloated it's not gassy there's no fermentation there i have regular bowel movements at its most basic that's a happy belly to me and i lived with an unhappy belly for about nine months Mm -hmm. i had a a parasite and it was unbeknown to me but every time i would eat cruciferous vegetables like kale in particular cauliflower and cabbage my stomach would blow up like a balloon. Mm-hmm. And this was maybe four years ago when kale was becoming that in vogue food. And so I was having kale in my smoothie in the morning. I was having kale salads and maybe cooked kale in the evening. And so when I had this bloated belly, and literally it was, it was big, like it was just full of air, I was like, man, have I developed a food sensitivity to kale? Because I was eating it so frequently, it's quite possible that I could have, but that wasn't the case. Nine months later, when I actually did some functional medicine testing on myself, I found out that I had a parasite, and this parasite was it was fermenting all of the fiber in the kale. And so kale has an extraordinary amount of fiber, which is one of the reasons that we want to eat it. In four cups, you have 10 grams of fiber. And so the little beast there was just chewing up that fiber and then producing all this gassiness. Now, I... I was fortunate enough to have that that knowledge to go, okay, there's something wrong here and to go and test myself. And then it took two weeks to eradicate the parasite. It can take much longer than that. Um, but after the two weeks when I had that flat stomach again, it was just such a relief to me from a, an, a mind energy perspective because I wasn't concerned about What's my stomach doing today? Yeah. Is it going to be fermented and, and bloating? I, at the time, I had a separate wardrobe. I'd have clothes that would cover my stomach so that if I was bloated, it wouldn't, couldn't tell. And being a nutritionist, it, I'm supposed to represent sort of wellness and health and, and, and a flat belly or a happy belly, and my belly just wasn't happy. And now all those clothes have gone. I have one dress just in case. <laughs> Oh, and it is absolutely liberating not having to worry about that because it was constantly on my mind. Yeah, that, that's so fascinating um, knowing that I think about parasites, it's not something that a lot of people talk about. And knowing that a person in the developed world, especially somebody in wellness, can still get a parasite and it's worth mm-hmm. looking into, it's absolutely fascinating. So... Um, how would somebody know if that's a possibility? So the, it's challenging to determine that. So a physical examination is unlikely to be able to identify that. Um, it's, and just going back to your point about the parasites in the developed world. So if you travel, and I was traveling extensively, 
then it's likely that you, it's fairly easy to pick it up. So I either picked mine up in Mexico or I picked it up when I was in Italy. And the bloating happened when I came back from Italy and I'd be eating a lot of cured meats. So I, have assu- I assume that I picked up the parasite from eating all the cured meats in, in Italy. Now, the most common reason for you to have a bloated belly from a microbial perspective is yeast. So when I'm working with somebody that is suffering from a bloated belly, I ask them, do you wake up bloated? Because if you wake up bloated, then it's unlikely to be food. It's more likely to be a micro- microbe of some sort, whether it's yeast, bacteria, or parasites. And yeast is the most common. And then and then they'll either be a bacteria or a parasite, but the latter two, you really need to do some type of testing, and I do stool testing on that. With a yeast overgrowth, um, it's so common that if somebody has a bloated bloated belly and they're craving sugar, I can pretty much assume that they have a yeast overgrowth. And we end up with a yeast overgrowth because we're exposed to many antibiotics. We have bombed ourselves with sugar and carbohydrates at some stage in our life. And then we ha- and they, the yeast and, and pathogenic microbes ex- replicate and explode pretty quickly. So it's very, very easy for the right microbial balance to get out of, to get out of whack. So when somebody comes to me, I normally work on that, which takes anywhere from two to four weeks to clear out the uh, yeast, if that's the case. And then I go back and repopulate the gut with nice microflora coming in from a powerful probiotic. That's so cool. It's like a math problem. (laughs) It is, actually. (laughs) What do we do? What shouldn't be there? That's the first thing that goes. And then then it's like having weeds in the garden. So yeah. you want to want to chop out the weeds, and then you want to go and replenish it with nice soil and a beautiful garden, and and so that's one piece. That's the microbial aspect to the to the, the uh, bloated belly. There's also a food piece, and we're hearing a lot about this. And this is a chapter that I um, helped write in your book was about food sensitivities, and we can develop a food sensitivity to anything. It starts with overexposure to that food and, and really stress. So our digestive tract is like a hollow tube and it has tiny little, like not quite holes, but it's permeable and it mm-hmm. enables glucose from carbohydrates to go into the bloodstream and amino acids to go into the bloodstream and they should be in that microscopic form. But what can happen is that when food is not digested appropriately, like gluten, which is a very large molecule, then it's abrasive on the digestive tract and that abrasiveness starts to cause little microscopic holes in the GI tract. And they cause it cause starts to cause that separation. And when you get those little microscopic holes, then food goes out of the digestive tract and into the bloodstream. And when that happens, then you get an antibody reaction and an inflammatory reaction within the body. And that will cause a cascade of many different effects from having a bloated abdominal area to just having being bloated all over the all over the body, like lots of water retention, you'll end up, you can end up with brain fogginess. So I I feel like I've had everything (laughs) digestively. I had a gluten sensitivity for three years. I had a dairy sensitivity for about a year. And so all of these are reversible if you look at healing the, your digestive system. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I would eat gluten, I wouldn't get abdominal cramps like, like a number of people end up with, but rather I would put on about four to five pounds and immediately, like the next day, I'd, I'd have that on there, which is just water. It wasn't fat. It was water coming in because the body was creating an inflammatory reaction towards these types of foods there. Just like when you cut yourself and there's a whole lot of – gets all swollen as the uh, macrophages come in, the white blood cells come in to help try and clear out all of that debris. That was really what was happening to, to my body there. And the more you expose yourself to these undigested foods – the more damage that's done to the GI tract. And then it's more likely that you're not going to be able to then absorb your own nutrients. So you may may be eating a really clean diet, but because your digestive tract isn't functioning appropriately, then you end up with malabsorption of nutrients. And so then then you don't feel as well as what you otherwise should. I'm sure you've had people come into you and and they've said, you know, my diet's really clean. Like I'm drinking green juices and I'm eating these salads and 
blah, 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 blah. There's something going on, like something's not yeah. functioning right. Yeah, and I think it's so fascinating that, that, I mean, everything that you're saying is fascinating, but especially the piece where your weight changes so drastically overnight. And I remember I had the same thing, but mine would actually change between like six to eight pounds per day. Wow. And wow, that's a lot. Wow. It's a lot. Yeah, yeah. And now my weight doesn't change almost no matter what I eat. It's like one plus or minus one pound, mm -hmm. but it's absolutely stable. Workout, yes. no workout, it's like very even. But I do remember the times when I would get up and was like, okay, eight <laughs> pounds up, eight pounds down in one day. Um, like, what's going on here? Yes. yes. Yeah, so it's... Um, totally familiar. Um, let's get a little bit, since there's so many different topics, and I think food sensitivity is a huge topic, but guys, if you want to learn more, you have to get the book, and Donna covers <laughs> it in a lot of detail. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what you do day to day to keep your belly happy. Okay, so number one is I eat a really clean diet. I really do. That to me is the foundation and it's principally a plant-based diet. I'm not vegan or vegetarian but about 70% of what I eat is, is plant-based and I, I will eat a lot of cruciferous vegetables. Now if you find that you are not digesting those cruciferous vegetables and sometimes when I'm stressed, uh, my digestion, digestion isn't as functioning as appropriately as what it otherwise should. And so I'll take a digestive enzyme to help break down the fiber and the protein in the foods that I'm eating. Because if I'm stressed then and I'm not chewing as much as what I should, then I can end up with larger molecules in my GI tract than I otherwise would. So I, I eat a clean diet. I'm conscious of where I am with my stress levels and I might add a digestive enzyme into that. And then I take a probiotic on a daily basis. And the one I'm using right now is the Dr. O'Hara's probiotic because that <laughs> you are using that one too. Yes, because I started traveling a lot and I was like, it just, it does make sense to have Claire labs like in the fridge everywhere. Oh. Right. And to me, it's the next generation of probiotics because it just isn't a probiotic. It has the active components of the probiotic. So the probiotics don't, they work by crowding out the pathogenic microbes to a small extent, but that's not their primary function. So the probiotics, they produce these organic acids and short chain fatty acids as well as hydrogen peroxide. And what that does is it helps to heal the lining of the GI tract and improve the integrity of it. And those little acids can kill off a lot of those microbes. And in the Dr. O'Hare's probiotic, that's what you get. You get those active byproducts, which is much more powerful than, than just the probiotic themselves. So in some people, particularly if I think their gut microflora is really out of balance, I'll use both. I'll use the Dr. O'Hare's probiotic and the Claire Labs probiotic that you, that you okay. spoke about so that you're getting a lot of these organic acids as well as um, probiotics coming in. So I, I do that. Um, th that's principally what I follow now because my digestive tract is, my digestion is pretty good. I really listen to my body and that's, that's, I know that's something that you espouse. It's just like get in sync with how, how you are. And, and listen, because on a daily basis or even just throughout the day, there will be fluctuations in, in your digestion by what you've eaten and how you feel emotionally as well. And if I end up with some type of digestive distress, one, I don't stress about it. I say, what is this telling me? What, what's going on here? My, my belly wants to be looked at right now so it wants me to pay attention to it and I really pay attention to it and I would look at am I not digesting appropriately is there something that I've eaten that's upsetting my uh, that's upsetting my stomach um, is there something happening happening with the, the microbes in my digestive tract so I really look along those lines yeah and I think it's really empowering for a lot of people because this weekend I did a retreat and everyone was like well 
I am supposed to have a healthy digestion because I do all these things, um, but sometimes my stomach still gets bloated and people start feeling bad about themselves. Like, mm-hmm. I'm a bad person because my stomach got bloated. Right. But in reality, it's something, as you mentioned, it's your body communicating that something is a little bit out of sync and it just needs correction. And there's really not much the body can do in terms of communicating besides like somehow negatively attracting your attention. Right, right. That's it. It's going to negatively uh, attract your attention because otherwise if it was nice and flat and straight that way, you wouldn't pay any attention to it. Exactly. Yay. And I think I think a great – well, a, more, a really common complaint that I get from people is that they're constipated. So 95% of the women – Almost everyone is constipated. Right. 95% of the women that come into my practice are constipated. Yep. And um, oh, I find – a very simple solution of adding in some magnesium, about 400 milligrams of magnesium and vitamin C together. So that, in the vast majority of the cases, will help with the bowel movement. And the reason for that is magnesium helps with the, the peristalsis process to enable to push the stool through the digestive tract. Now, magnesium is also the nutrient that's used to create your stress hormones. So as you can imagine, the more stressed you are, the more you're going to be rubbing your body of that magnesium so you can deal with the stresses that are at play as opposed to enabling that that muscle contraction and relaxation. So it makes sense that that's the case. Yeah, and I think it also happens to a lot of women is that when they're stressed, the contraction is just not going to be as smooth and regular as it should be, and that can lead to extra gas. Oh, c- completely. And that's really the first thing that I ask somebody when they come in with a an unhappy belly as uh, when was the last time you had a bowel movement? <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and sometimes, yeah. And sometimes people don't even realize how constipated they are because they might be going to the bathroom, but not um, eliminating fully. So once they start taking, whether it's magnesium or um, something else, or there's just kind of being more mindful of it, or even if they're adding chia seed pudding to it and adding enough healthy fats, and suddenly they start going to the bathroom like five times a day and they're like, where it's all coming from? Right. And, in the, it, and in reality, it just takes the body a little bit of time to kind of clean, clean itself out. Right. And one of the biggest mi- misconceptions that there is on constipation is fiber. So fiber is, there's a, there's a fine balance with fiber, like, isn't there? Hold, yeah, hold, hold for a second. One thing before you start talking about fiber is like if you will look into Inuit society, like mm. mm-hmm. no fiber, right? But lots of fats, lots of fats, lots of fats. So the lubrication yep. to get the stool through and passed out. Really, really, really valid point. So I see people loading up on fiber or panicking about not getting enough fiber, and they just become more constipated. And yeah. what tends to be missing is fats or water. So you need the two of those to be able to lubricate the stool. A hundred percent. And I think one of the mistakes that a lot of people do, they'll start take, taking psyllium husk. Mm-hmm. And it just kind of clogs everything even worse than it was before. And so interestingly, when I run food sensitivity tests, when people are taking psyllium husk, it'll come up with them being sensitive to that. You know, psyllium husk is a little abrasive on the digestive tract. And even so, if you look at it, it's like it's very harsh. Right, very, very harsh. So think about that piercing the lining of the GI tract. Yeah. And so it, it, you and I don't use it at all. And, um, in, and I'd encourage you to find somebody who's using that um, to read Nadia's book because there'll be information in there about that because it's just it's, – it's, it's can do more damage to your GI tract than, than necessarily be helpful. And I think a good, um, a good, not necessarily substitute, but something that pe- can people do is a chia seed pudding, which is it's lubricating, it's jelly-like, it's very gentle, mm. um, and you can add some healthy fats with like almond milk. So that usually tends to work well for people. That's great. Now that's great from a constipation perspective, uh, because in the three tablespoons of chia seed, then they get the same amount of omegas that they get in a piece of fish. And they also get 12 grams of fiber, and it's soluble fiber. So as you said, it's jelly-like and nice and soft. However, some people can't tolerate chia seed, 
And if, if there's people out there that they mm-hmm. find that when they eat chia seed, they get bloated, there's a microbial issue. Okay. Like that's one of the ways that, that I can tell whether it's microbial or food related. Can you eat chia seed? And if you bloat that's immediately with chia seed, then it's going to be a microbe. Huh. Oh, I'm not, and I had an issue with chia seed as well. I love chia seed now, mm-hmm. but at the time when I had the parasite, no way. There's no way that I could have that I could have chia seed. And what would happen is I would get as soon as I'd eat it, I'd be starving, like starving. You think how can this happen? There's there's ten grams of this or twelve grams of fiber in it. There's the same amount of protein as an egg, and there's the same amount of omega threes as a piece of salmon. How can I possibly become all of a sudden starving after I've eaten that? And just I, I I don't know the mechanism behind that, but then the, the little parasite that, that was there just must have been feasting on it <laughs> and, and and enjoying it and not enabling me to get any of the nutrients. That's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so a couple of things I think most people know about gluten and dairy sensitivity that those can trigger sensitivity quite easily. What are some other foods that um, I guess make your belly unhappy and then your client's belly unhappy in general? It's a great question. It's different for everybody. Mm-hmm. The, as you said, the most common are gluten and dairy. And the reason for that is we're exposed to it on such a frequent basis that it's highly likely that we have a food sensitivity to it. Once we have created food sensitivities, we then set up the GI tract to, to respond adversely to many different foods. So once you have those little holes in your GI tract, you could start responding to anything. You could start responding to adversely to almonds, which I see frequently. That's what I had. And now I can back to normal relationship with almonds. <laughs> I see I see it frequently. I'm still not great with almonds, so I don't use a lot of them, mm-hmm. particularly in their whole form. It just doesn't that that's like trusting your instinct. That just doesn't make me feel good. I mean they're fine if they're crushed in something. Yeah. Um some people don't tolerate eggs well, but it's going to be dependent on them. However, I would say that if people have taken gluten and dairy out of their diet and sugar and they're eating a plant based diet and they're still not feeling good and they really feel like it's food related, then one piece that might be missing will be healing the lining of the GI tract because the the GI tract has become more permeable than it should be. And one of the supplements I use for that is called glutamine because glutamine is fuel that that the cells on the lining of the GI tract use to replicate. And that takes anywhere from six to nine months to to heal that process. And I I mentioned before. Yeah. And I think I mean, glutamine has other benefits in terms of helping to correct blood sugar imbalances, absolutely. right? So it's not something that can be detrimental to somebody who right. is just experimenting right. with it. Right. It helps to decrease crave cravings for sugar as well. And it's an amino acid. So it typically goes into the lining of the GI tract. And if it didn't go there, then it would just go into the amino acid pool and the body would then utilize it to create other amino acids. It, many, many, many years ago, bodybuilders would load up on glutamine powder to help build up their muscles, but it didn't work because the cells in the GI tract would just consume it all. They were like, goody, goody, you've just given me food. <laughs> Woo, <yay!"> More bodybuilders. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then how to build their muscles there um, because it consumed it all. Mm. So just just going back to food, is um, it trust how your body feels. And I am like you, I work with the seasons. So in summer, I will eat foods that are a lot more raw-based. And in winter, I will go with foods that are more cooked-based. So I will often have a, just through convenience, I'll end up with a salad when I'm working at lunch, at lunch, and then in the evening, I'll cook foods. And that's really what my body wants. And then in summer, I'll have more lighter foods. I'll have like a big lettuce salad or a spinach salad, something like that. Cool. So what's your... um one advice for people who are just beginning on their happy belly journey. And I know it's hard to choose one. We've done several other interviews. So guys, you can definitely um, watch other Donna's interviews. I'm going to post links right below the video. But something um, like somewhere to start. Okay. So the when you wake up in the morning, 
ask, is your stomach bloated? If your stomach is bloated, then it's probably a microbial issue. So have a look at that and a probiotic is going to be helpful for that. If you don't wake up with a bloated stomach and you find it gets worse throughout the day, it's probably that you're not breaking down your food appropriately and you might need a digestive enzyme or there's some type of food sensitivity there. And if it's the latter, then cut out the gluten and the dairy. And if that hasn't worked, then cut out the cruciferous vegetables, which are things like kale, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, and see how your body responds to that. And if it's the latter, then it's more likely to be a digestive enzyme issue or a microbial issue because ultimately you want to be able to reintroduce those foods, the, the cruciferous vegetables, because they're so incredibly helpful to the body. So yeah. it's sort of a, a tier process then. Yep. And, yeah, there's definitely much more to it. So we talk about it in the book. And another thing, guys, I want to invite you to a two-hour video panel that's going to be available for everyone who buys the book. And Donna is going to be one of the panelists, and we get, we're going to get more into bacteria, probiotics, um, cooking, um, healthy eating habits. So that's going to be a much more in-depth um, workshop online and it's also free so for now um donna where can people find you so they can find me on my website which is www.foodcoachnyc.com they can find me on facebook which is food coach ny they're the best places to find me okay great and thanks um, nadia yeah make sure to check out spinach and yoga slash happy belly to learn more about the book, to watch the video trailer and stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you.